I'm excited. Um, today we're starting a new series, and uh, we've been kind of planning this for a while. I think we only talked about, actually, I don't know how much I've talked about it here, but uh, we've been talking about it behind the scenes. What were we going to do after Easter? And if we didn't mention a lot of it, but we're going to be doing a series on Genesis to Revelation, not the entire Bible in between, and it's all today. It's going to be a really long service. Um, no, but Genesis to Revelation, the heart behind this series is, is two parts. One is, where did we begin as humanity? What was God's intention for us? But then where do we kind of end, but it's not really the end. Where is the end of what we know for a new beginning? And that's Revelation. And, you know, over these last couple of years, I think I've had more questions about the end of the world than I've ever had. And uh, just so you know, if you come and ask me those questions, you often get this answer. I don't know. <laughs> because some of this is just a mystery. But there is stuff that God teaches us through Genesis and Revelation that I think are extremely important. So we're going to be on this series for quite a while. And the series title is actually called From Garden to City. And the reason for that, we're going to kind of open it up today um, as I read through Genesis 1 and 2 and a little bit of Revelation, is that we start in a garden. We see this story of humanity start in a garden setting. But we see in Revelation 21, 22 at the end there that it ends in a new city. And there's something about why it's like that. And I want, we're going to kind of open that up. That's going to be a lot of the point of as we go through, but we're going to learn a lot. There's going to be a lot of topics that we hit through Genesis. If you've read Genesis at all, it just shows a lot of who we have always been. You know, there's a reality that this, we're just cyclical people. We might have new technology, but we act the same way we've been acting since the beginning of time. And it, it teaches us about humanity. It teaches us about what we were designed for, but it also teaches us where's our downfalls and what is God trying to do through this whole process. And so this is going to be kind of a long series. I actually will tell you, I don't know how long it's going to be, but I, would, I can see it at least going up almost to August. There's going to be some breaks in there. We're, we have some guest speakers. Mark Estes is coming in a few weeks. Um, we have some people that are going to be coming through the summer, so we'll have some breaks, but we're going to be sitting on this topic for a while, and the reason is I don't want to rush through because it's really important, because if you don't know why you're here or what God's original intentions were for humanity, sometimes it's hard to actually see through the clutter of the modern world to our purpose and design. And we want to land on that. We want to know who we are as humans, who we are as followers of Christ, and what is the purpose and design and intention of our lives. So, awesome. If you have a Bible, I'd love for you to open to Genesis 1. It's really easy. It's at the beginning. And uh, if you don't have a Bible, we always want to remind you we have these couple carts in the back. Those Bibles are for free. If you don't have one, you can take it home. If you want to borrow it for the day, feel free to borrow it for the day. So before I jump into actually reading, I wanted to do just a tiny little lesson on the Bible. Because every time we start to read through the Bible or we do a book or, or kind of do a a little bit more on the exegetical side of things, which just means we're tearing it apart scripture by scripture as we go, um, which isn't exactly what we're doing. I, I want you guys to understand some of the background of the Bible if you don't. So I'm going to, I often read or almost always read out of the New Living Translation of the Bible. If you don't know anything about translations, you're going to get a small course real quick. There are a lot of translations of the Bible. In fact, Technically, there are no translations of the Bible. They are transliterations. Because the Hebrew in the Old Testament has no such thing as a word-for-word -word replacement into the English language. So they have to literally, it's called transliteration. They're trying to understand what the Hebrews meant because their language was a picture language. And then trying to put that in the English language. And just, just don't get worried. They do really good at it. Okay? And then there's translations from the New Testament, which was Greek. Um, and so I want to give you just a quick background of why I read out of the New Living Translation. One, I find it to be really easy to understand. The New Living Translation, it comes from a group of texts, and there's really two main groups of texts, meaning uh, text manuscripts that have been found over the thousands of years here, 
that most Bible translations come from. And, and there's two groups. And the one group is called the Alexandrian texts. And that is the grouping that has created uh, the ESV, the English Standard Version. That's the Bible that I study out of. And then, um, and that would be a more, what they would say, word-for-word translations. They're trying to do their best to be as literal as possible. Whereas the New Living Translation would be considered a thought-for-thought translation. It means that they'll add English words in there simply because we're not getting the full thought because of how we think as English people compared to how Hebrews thought. Now, there's, it's still very good. It's still very, you know, safe. No, don't think that, like, there's unsafe translations. Well, there's a couple that I just wouldn't call translations. The message is not a translation. I love it. And she's like, oh, I love the message too. But it's technically not a translation, okay? Uh, actually, I'll, I'll, I don't mind calling a few of these out. The Passion Translation, uh, we should just take the translation off the end of that. Uh, that is like the message. There's a lot of extras in there. It's not necessarily bad. I actually loved how the guy illuminates some things, but it's not technically a translation. So the ESV and the NLT is where I study from, and that is from the grouping called the Alexandrian text. The reason I like those texts, and this is all opinion, just so you know, the reason I like those texts is they're older. There's less of them, actually, but they are older. They're a few hundred years older, meaning the manuscripts we have today in our hands, not mine, but somebody that's smarter than me, um, they're older texts. means they were written long before the ones, the other grouping, which is called the Byzantine texts. It's got a bunch of names. Uh, Textus Receptus, the majority texts. The reason they use the majority texts because there's a lot more of these texts that exist, but they're a lot newer they're four, 500 years younger than the other texts that have been found. Now, some of you might right now be freaking out like, what the heck? I thought the Bible just dropped out of the sky and it was perfect. <laughs> um, it's complicated. That's the easiest way to say it when it comes to the Bible. It's complicated. If you read the Bible and you read it as the scripture of God and you read it as you know, inspired word of God, you, you still have to have faith in that aspect. Um, but I like I like to read out of this one grouping of textings, and sometimes I'm just saying this out there. I want I just wanted to teach you a little bit this morning about some of the background of the Bible. I personally like the Alexandrian texts because they're older. I find them a little more clear. Uh, and the other text, which is most people would know, the Byzantine text is where the is where the King James version came from. So, but it was because that's all they had at the time. They didn't find the older texts until 100 150 years after the. King James Version of the Bible had already been translated and written. They started finding older texts just through archaeological excavations, all those kind of things. So, are you bored out of your mind? Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, some people are like, I do not care about any of this stuff. <laughs> but for me, I, I want to understand the background of, of, the, of how we put our trust in this book. Because we do put our trust in this book. And so, but anybody that gets really stuck on some stuff, like, I would just say it's, it's a lot more complicated than we understand. And I just gave you the simplest version of trying to understand this. Um, you know, there's, there's, it's actually far more complicated than just these two different texts. But this is the main way that Bibles get translated. And then there's guys who just have given their whole lives to understanding ancient Hebrew. And they literally will sit in a room with other guys who have given their whole lives to understand ancient Hebrew and Greek. And then they just argue and debate over words. <laughs> and that's how you get translations. Uh, NIV being an incredible translation too. I don't tend to read it, but that's, that comes from the Alexandrian text as well. So, there, that's for free, has nothing to do with our series. But I want you to know where, we're, where I read from. I get these questions at times. Hey, why don't you ever read out of the King James? Uh, one, I just don't understand it half the time. It's too old for me. Uh, but I do have new King James Version scriptures memorized. I have to constantly <laughs> go back to that. So, Garden to City, Genesis 1. We're just going to pick up here, and we're going to read through two chapters in Genesis today. And I want to talk about a few main themes that come out as we talk about this idea of where did humanity begin? What was God's intention for? So let's just start right in verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the water. So we see this creative moment begin where God is creating things. In verse 3 it says, Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. Then he separated the light from the darkness, and God called the light day and the darkness light. Night and evening passed, and morning came, marking the first day. Then God said, let there be a space between the waters to separate the waters of the heavens from the waters of the earth. And that is what happened. God made this space to separate the waters of the earth from the waters of the heavens. God called the space sky, and evening passed, and morning came, marking the second day. You know, sometimes we read through this stuff, and... uh, I would just like to make a point. Really, this comes from a good friend of mine, Bill Jaggers, who we've had lots of discussions around Genesis and creation and what did it look like. The order of Genesis creation is the order that science even says it would have to take place. You can't have anything without light. Literally. Organisms cannot survive without the light that the sun produces. Even the deepest, darkest be- things that live in the darkest parts of the ocean only survive, even though they don't need light themselves, they need light because they eat the things that need light. And so light is the first thing. And, I, and so we, even when we read through Genesis, I love it. it ta- it's science as well, right? Like if we get too literal, did it take seven days? Did it not take seven days? I'll just be honest, I don't care. Jesus could have done it in one day. God could have done it with the snap of a finger, or maybe he watched it work itself out for a lot of years. To me, that doesn't make the point. But I do believe God's creative powers are what initiate everything. And so we see this initiation, and he creates light. He creates day and night. And then he creates a space, right? We know what that is. That's our atmosphere. Guess what you don't have on a planet? You don't have life if you don't have an atmosphere, (laughs) He separates it. They call it sky here, but it's our atmosphere. It's what literally keeps us from floating into space. (laughs) And then God said in verse 9, Let the waters beneath the sky flow together into one place, so dry ground may appear. And that's what happened. God called the dry ground land and the waters seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the land sprout with vegetation, every sort of seed-bearing plant and trees that grow seed-bearing fruit. These seeds will then produce the kinds of plants and the trees from which they came. And that is what happened. The land produced vegetation, all sorts of seed-bearing plants and trees with seed-bearing fruit. Their seeds produced plants and trees of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. And evening passed and morning came, marking the third day. Then God said, let great lights appear in the sky to separate the day from the night. Let them mark off the seasons, the days, and the years. If you don't know anything about the moon... And how it actually is the main contributor to our seasons. Like, these, this is science. We know this now. Verse 15, let these lights in the sky shine down on the earth. And that, that is what happened. God made two great lights, the sun and the moon. The large one to govern the day and the smaller one to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set these lights in the skies to light the earth, to govern the day and the night, to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. An evening passed and morning came, marking the fourth day. Then God said, let the water swarm with fish and other life. Let the skies be filled with birds of every kind. You know, if you know anything about science, this is the moment where science doesn't know how to explain the Precambrian explosion. You ever heard of that? It's when in the, as, as they, they dig deep in the archaeological stuff, they just find a moment where all of a sudden a whole bunch of fish and life in the sea just showed up. Sounds familiar to me. And this is like, if you really like science and stuff, you dive into, this is the process of life. Like water is what, water and light is what produces light, right? Or life. And you can't really have animals without vegetation first, right? You can't, you can't really have humans without animals first because we eat them. Um, you have this process where the, the first thing that's produced gives life to the next thing, and the next thing produced gives life to the next thing. And it says, So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that scurries and swarms in the water, and every sort of bird, each producing offspring of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. 
Then God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply. Let the fish fill the seas and the birds multiply on the earth. And the evening passed and morning came, marking the fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth produce every sort of animal, each producing offspring of the same kind, livestock, small animals that scurry along the ground, and wild animals. And that is what happened. God made all sorts of wild animals, livestock, small animals, each able to produce offspring of the same kind, and God saw that it was good. I want to stop here for a second. It's an interesting point made in Genesis here. And one of the points I want to make this morning. And when you read this, it's easy just to think, well, God's, you know, this description is just kind of giving a description of animals. But there's a description of different kinds of animals here. And the three, the three or four different kinds, it's livestock, small animals, wild animals. And we're going to get to a point where we talk about humanity and part of the intention here that even before humans come on the scene God creates animals that don't survive survive without us that's livestock you see livestock for some reason the world today has made it has actually kind of produced this lie that the earth would be better without humans anybody feel that in movies I mean, it's real, right? People are afraid of overpopulation. They're, you know, they, they act like we're, you know, well, the truth is we are destroying the world. I'm not going to, I'm not going to placate that. If you don't think you're destroying the world as humans, just drive through um, Galveston, Texas area, where there are over 30 chemical plants, and you will want to close your windows. I remember the first time I drove through that area, it was the first time I realized, oh, maybe... Maybe we really are polluting the earth. (laughs) Just because we live in northern New York, where it's beautiful, clear skies, doesn't mean we aren't doing some bad things. But what we see in this this is, is, well, humanity right now is kind of in science, and there's some specific scientists in the last 200 years that have kind of perpetuated this lie that the earth would be better without humans. But the truth is, whole species of animals would die without us. You know what happens to a sheep if its wool isn't cut? It dies. You've seen those stories probably on Facebook. They find these sheep that have been wandering for two, three years, and the thing can't even breathe. It's this gigantic big. Guess what sheep don't do? Cut their own wool. Think about that. That that should kind of boggle your mind. There are literal animals created that need human intervention so that they survive, and they produce something for us in return. You know, I remember a couple years ago, I saw this whole, uh, people were protesting about, <clears throat> about uh, dairy farmers milking cows. And I'm like, someone should tell them that if the cows aren't milked, they die. Like, for real. And did you know that a cow produces nearly four times as much milk as it needs for its calf? Did you know that? That doesn't make sense. Why doesn't it just produce what the calf needs? But it doesn't. For some reason, it produces more. And if it's not milked, it actually will die. There's literal animals created from the beginning of time that needed human intervention. And it was for human, you know, consumption and human, uh, you know, interaction, but also for us to take care of them. And so there's this idea that we need to make sure we understand humanity in its right way is supposed to make the earth a better place. It's supposed to actually shape it. The earth would not be better off without us. You're quiet. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like ourselves. Very interesting statement here. Immediately, we start to see that there's something complicated in this idea of God. It's not it's not this singular understanding. It literally says, like ourselves. It was, it was written from the very first time in Hebrew, this pluralistic understanding that God is multiple persons but one being. And don't even try to always wrap your mind around that. But here they, here they are, you know, and we understand it now, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And they're saying, let's make humans like ourselves. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. 
In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Very important scripture here. And then it says, then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it. I want to stop there for a second and give you a little explanation of some, some of our own beliefs in, as New Testament church. I believe that men and women were always supposed to rule and reign and govern together. You know, there's, there's, there's a patriarchy thing that happens in the Bible and makes its way all the way through, and it's still today, where there's this idea that men are over women. I'll tell you what, it was never supposed to be that way. We'll find out next week, when I do chapter 3, that the curse is women trying to subdue men and men lording over women. Both of those are the curse. You see, we were created in God's image, both male and female, he created them. And then he said, let them rule and reign and govern. See, we don't rule and reign and govern the earth well unless both of us are doing it. We're, we're all called, every one of us, and, and not to get into a weirdness, but I believe in only two genders. And male and female, when they work together in the roles that God has designed them to do, they actually have an authority together to rule and reign and govern and create and shape a world that doesn't exist today because we have never done that well. But that's the design. If you don't like it, ask God about it when you get to heaven. It's Genesis 1. The first chapter, he puts this purpose into men and women. And he says, listen, I didn't just create you just to exist. And, and the first thing he creates us to do is to actually look like him, to bear his image, to be like them. But then he says, now I'm going to give you a job and a purpose, a design for why you exist. And it's to rule and reign and govern this thing that I just created. And we're called to do it together. So it says, fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Then God said, look, I've given you every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. And I've given every green plant as food for all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. Everything that has life. And that is what happened. Then God looked over all he had made, and he saw that it was very good. The evening passed and morning came, marking the sixth day. So let's jump to chapter 2. So the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. And on the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work. Listen, another point here, just lots of points are going to be made in these messages. If God gets tired, you get tired. If God needs rest... After working for six days, you need rest. We, we live under an illusion, I think it's especially as Americans, that if we work more, we'll produce more. But the truth is, there's something built into our design that requires rest. It's why you literally can't stay awake for very long. The older you get, that seems to be earlier in the day. <laughs> But there's this thing built into us where we're, we're meant to rest and be beings of rest. And I, I see this moment with God. I'm like, geez, if God takes time to rest, man, we should be serious about taking times to rest in our lives. And I think we, we kind of combat this Western mentality that's like work more, produce more, achieve more, get more done. And, and it's like you're always in a race, either it's with someone else or a race against yourself to just achieve the most things possible. But there's a place where rest is meant for our lives. If we're like God and God rests, we rest. It said, and God blessed the seventh day and he declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. This is the account of the creation of the heavens and the earth. And then we get another kind of account which gives us a little more insight. It says, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, neither wild plants nor grains were growing on the earth. The Lord God had not yet sent rain to water the earth, and there were no people to cultivate the soil. Instead, springs came up from the ground and watered all the land. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life 
into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he placed the man he had made. The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and that produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So we see these two trees that are pointed out. It says, Then a river watered the garden and, and then flowed out of Eden, divided into four branches. The first branch called the, the Pishon. I know that sounds bad. <laughs> flowed around the entire land where gold is found. The gold of that land is exceptionally pure, aromatic resin and onyx. And the second branch called the Gihon flowed around the entire land of Cush. The, the third branch called the Tigris flowed east of the, the land of Asher. And the fourth branch is called the Euphrates. You know, there's some real significance in the names of those things. Um, they, they kind of all mean similar stuff. The, the, the one that sounds like I'm saying piss on, but I'm not, um, <laughs> means increase. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm still childish. It means increase. And then the Gihon one, it means bursting forth. Tigris means rapid, and Euphrates means fruitfulness. That there's this, this thing that God, even in the naming of things, he was trying to, trying to declare into his creation what it was supposed to be like. And you see it through the creation of the other animals and the fish, that everything that he made is supposed to expand. Everything is supposed to multiply. Everything is supposed to actually increase. And that there's a place where, where everything he's created is supposed to do that. And especially humanity, we, we have the exact same image that God has, and he's the great creator. So what are we supposed to be? Creators. That we're supposed to create things around us that weren't there before. You know, the, the reality of like God sets up this planet and he sets up these people and he, he sets up this world, but he give, and he doesn't do everything for us. He just gives us a lot of raw materials. But then he says, here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to do something with this. And he puts the image of himself on us, which is this creator image that we're supposed to create the world around us. I think it's why there's, I mean, you see it in, in the world today. There's some people that just seem to really take hold of this identity and they run with it, even when they're not Christians. One of these guys is Elon Musk. I mean, we're all knowing about him now because he just randomly buys Twitter. But I like watching this guy. I follow him a lot because I, I've never, it's just rare to find someone who literally dreams so big and then somehow accomplishes them. Because this guy, even if he doesn't know Jesus, he's taken seriously something that was imparted into him just because he bears the image of God, even though he doesn't know it or act like it or show people it, that he is actually being a creator because God made all of us to be creators. And sometimes I look at the way Western society has developed and I think, man, have we crushed that creator spirit. It's like, here, wake up, 5.30, get to work by 6.30, work in your cubicle, work, work in your, your little thing, do your stuff, get done by 5, get out as quick as you can, go home, tend your lawn, <laughs> go to bed. Well, maybe watch Netflix for three hours. <laughs> and we get into routine and we forget that there's purpose in it. And it's not that any of our jobs are bad or wrong or pointless. The reality is that we're supposed to be creators. And if we just get stuck into some routine of life and, and some just kind of making it through so that we have some retirement one day, we forget and we lose a purpose that we've all been created to create. Now, we're not all create, created to create the same things. That's what's incredible about the infinite uniqueness of humanity. Every one of us sees things differently and has different ideas and, and, and produces different things. And there's this place where as humans, I think when we get closer to God, we're supposed to get closer to being creative people again. Side note. Verse 15, the Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. 
But the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. I want to stop there. I, I've often preached on this verse. God placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. That just to remind us, and I've said it a number of times even this morning, God creates man and he's in right relationship with God immediately. There's no sin in the world yet. There's nothing wrong happening, but he's in right relationship. That's not all there is. There's purpose too. And he gives him a job to do immediately. He says, here, tend and watch over it. The ESV says this, work it and keep it. And when you look up in those words, you try to understand the definition of that tend and watch and work and keep. I wrote it in your notes a little bit. It means to work, to serve, to shape, to cultivate. We're called to shape the world we're in. It's actually why it starts in a garden but ends in a city. Now listen, I don't want to live in a city. I hope there's rural areas in this city. But if you, do you go to a city? I, I don't know about you, but my dad's in infrastructure. He builds bridges and highways. And whenever I go to a city, I literally marvel, how are we capable of this? Skyscrapers. I've been to the Burj Khalifa, the tallest building in the world. It's got 168 stories. I went to the 148th floor because just super rich people own the floors above that. And I stood there and I looked down at one of the richest cities in the world, the tallest building in the world, and I think to myself, man, we are capable of incredible things. And that's part of the point. When we see this begin in a garden where you have this raw material understanding of the world, but God calls us to shape it and actually to create something even better than what was the Garden of Eden. I've heard people talk about heaven, like, oh, we're going to go back to the Garden of Eden. I'm like, no, we're not going to go back to that. That'd be weird, first of all. There's no clothes even. We're going we're gonna to be building something newer and better. We're going to shape something that actually is creative and amazing in this world. And that's the city that we start to see in Revelation. You know, it says it comes down from heaven. I think some of that's symbolic. I actually believe we build it. I hope I literally get to put my hands on whatever the materials are of that city and build it. I like to build stuff, if you don't know. That there's a place where God calls us to shape something, and it's why it starts in a garden and ends in a city. Now, what we've realized after chapter 3 of Genesis, we're not going to get there today, is that we screw things up. And we get misguided, and, and we, we make poor decisions, and that's why even in the world today, we have done things to damage the very creation that God's called us to cultivate and shape. That we're called to actually care for this environment, to care for this world. And we haven't always done the best job at that. And we should, we should admit that. You want to watch a movie that creeps you out about what we've done to our planet? Watch a movie called Dark Waters. It's just about some companies that created things that is literally now in every living, every living thing in the planet has chemicals in them. I would tend to think that's probably not God's design. <laughs> and there's a place where we've messed it up, but we're going back to a place where God's going to restore all things to his intention, but we are called to shape the world in which we live. This is the design of humanity from the beginning of time. Then the Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. And we know this part of the story. It says that he brings this woman on the scene and it's he, even uh, Adam declares, this one is bone from my bone, flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from me. And that word helper, just real quick, just so that you understand, uh, it's not derogatory. <laughs> that word helper is better um, described, if you look it up in the Hebrew, one who completes. So this is what's interesting. Man, we weren't complete yet. <laughs> And God's watching us, and it seems like there's a little bit of time, and it's like we're getting some work done. He's like, yeah, they need some help. I need to send someone who's going to complete them. That's, that's the picture of what happens here. It's not this like, oh, I need a helper. Hey, can you get me some water? I'm tired over here. Like, 
that's nonsense. The two of us are actually what create the image of God the best. We're called to govern together. We're called to work this earth here. We're called to shape it together. So now I want to turn to Revelation. I want to kind of finish on this note. So we see this picture of a garden. I'm not going to get into where we mess it up yet. We'll, we'll pick that up next, next uh, message. So we start in this garden. We start in this place where God's created this incredible place for us. And he gives us everything we need in it. Of course, he does create the opportunity for us to reject it with that darn one tree. Someone should have cut it down. But it's there. You know why? Not because God wanted us to choose it, but because he had to give us choice. You see, creation without volitional will isn't really creation at all. It's control. And so Jesus, you've got God, Jesus, and and your Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, and they're deciding, even though we're going to make someone in our image, we're going to have to give them volitional will to choose our way, to look like us in this world, earth, to actually act like us, but they do have to have the choice to maybe want to learn the hard way. Man, dang it, we chose the hard way. And so we see that, and we're going to see that play out in chapter 3. But I want to turn now to Revelation 21. I'll just give you a glimpse. I'm not going to walk through this whole thing. I just want to give you a glimpse of this idea from garden to city. And so this is John, right? John is getting this revelation, um, this vision as he's writing. He's, you know, he's actually on the Isle of Patmos. He's been in prison there. Uh, this is the Apostle John. And he gets this vision. These angels come to speak to him. He's seeing all these things and he's writing it down. And this is where we pick up in verse 1 of chapter 21. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. The thing I wanted to point out, of maybe the biggest point from Genesis 1 and 2 all the way to this moment in Revelation where this new city, this city of God comes down, is there's two points here. In the, in the garden, there was relationship with God where he actually resided with them. You know, we see in, in chapter 3, it says he walked with them in the cool of the day. I can't even imagine what that was like. To walk with God besides you, in the flesh, seeing him, feeling him, And then we get all the way to Revelation and there's this thing that happens, right? We know sin comes in the world. The separation between us and God comes in the world. And then you even see a few other instances throughout Genesis we're going to notice where God shows up literally in person, in being. But then it gets rarer and rarer and rarer to the point where none of us have probably ever seen God physically. And it's like we're all looking forward to that day when that's going to be our reality, when this city will be our reality, and this declaration from God himself, it says, look, my home will now be among them. That's what he has, that's his desire for us. You see, God's desire was always to live with us, to reside with us, to be with us in every situation, in every circumstance. And we see even in John 14, when the Holy Spirit gets sent, He says, I'll come and make my home within you. There's a place that we don't have to wait till heaven to have him reside within us. But there's also this looking forward to a place where he's literally with us in being, in person. And though we look forward to that day, we don't want to wait till that day, right? You see, what I don't want to do is show up on some new city's doorsteps or the gates of heaven, or however that thing's going to look, and and have to introduce myself. I'm not sure it's going to go well for you at that point. 
I want to have, I want to know that I've already lived with him. That I've invited him into my life, into every area of my being, into every area of who I am, into every decision, to every circumstance. I don't want to wait till the end to have God reside with me. I look forward to the moment when it's going to be more real than I can even imagine. But right now, I need to make God's home in my heart. And I want to give an opportunity right now, if, if you're in this place, you're watching online, and you, you think to yourself, I don't know if I've ever really let God into my heart. I don't know if I've ever really let him into those deepest places. You know, can we stand right now? I'm just going to pray. But if you're saying, I don't know if, if I've let him in in that way, I'd encourage you right now, start. Invite him. See, that's what salvation is. It's, it's something he's already done. He's done the work for it on the cross. We, we talked about it on Easter all the way leading up. He's done the work. There's nothing separating you from him anymore. You just have to receive his grace over your life, and then he can come and literally live with you. I don't know what's better than that. That the God of this universe would want to make his home within us would want to walk with us and be with us. So I want to give an opportunity right now, if that's you, I'm going to ask you to repeat this prayer after me. I'm going to ask everybody to say it, just that way we, we get everybody anyway. So I'm going to ask you, let's, re, let's repeat this prayer. God, we thank you for what you've done. We thank you for what you're doing but we want to invite you in. We don't want to hold you at a distance. We want you close. So we receive your grace today. We receive that salvation today. And we ask you, come and make your home in our heart. God, I pray right now that you would touch every person in this room, every person online. God, for those who maybe are whispering that prayer for the very first time in their life, God, let it grow deep inside them. Let that seed take root within them and do something within them. Transform them to who they were called to be. God, for those of us who have been following you, God, I ask that we would represent you well, that we would actually go back to bearing the image of God well in this world. That we would be reminded that when people look at us, it isn't just us they should see, they should see you. So Jesus, I ask you, shape us into what you've created us to be so that we can be those that shape the world into what you desire it to be. God, we thank you that your intention was always for relationship, for purpose. God, we ask you to draw us back into relationship and purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What a great message. I know I'm challenged um, to just be who I was created to be, right? To remember that I have the living God inside of me. And so I was reading a devotional this week, and it was about um, Queen Esther, and just, you know, she was born for such a time as this. And I just want to say to you, you were born for such a time as this. I was born for such a time as this. And you know what? I don't want to live a mediocre life where I'm just going along comfortable. I'm challenged today to say, okay, God, what does that mean for me that I was born for such a time as this? How am I supposed to change the world? How am I supposed to be creative? How am I supposed to represent that the living God is living inside of me? So let's this week just remember who we are. Remember who's living in us. That's the most important thing that the, you know, the God of the heavens, the God of the earth, he lives inside of us. So we have resurrection power living inside of us. That should change everything. Everywhere we go, the atmosphere should change because we're there and he's living inside of us. So just have a great week. Be blessed. If this is your first time here, or maybe you said the prayer for the first time, there's going to be people in the welcome room um, to just talk with you, and there's going to be donuts and coffee. Um, So stop in there if you feel led, and um, just have a great week.